Hi everyone, I'm Isaac Gonzalez. For those of you that don't know me, I am Catherine's partner and I am also a professional programmer and graphic designer. I am the tech brains behind everything we work on. I custom built our course platforms, the Tangent software, our free Chrome extension test check, and a whole lot of other projects we've worked on. The following class you're about to see, See Like an Artist, is a live recording of a workshop we created for our T-shirt revolutionaries course. It's a precursor to my Photoshop classes that are also part of the course. It's a topic that's dear to me and it's my attempt to sum up years of college into an hour long class. This class serves as a great introduction to learning graphic design. My original goal was to help t-shirt designers, but the principles can be applied to hoodies, leggings, book covers, shower curtains, basically anything that you can print. We recently released Tangent templates to help our community create notebooks, journals, planners, and more in Amazon CreateSpace. I've been so blown away by the positive response it received that I wanted to make this video available to everyone because I think understanding what makes a design look fantastic can really help you stand out on the Amazon platform and ultimately get you more sales. Whether you're designing yourself or outsourcing your design projects, I believe my class, See Like an Artist, can help you look at design in a new light and understand why some designs are exceptionally eye-catching and appealing. And so you can create them every time. I'm super excited to share this and I hope you enjoy it. The purpose of this class is to change the way that you see the world around you, to understand what makes pleasing art and why, and to learn how to upvalue your creations. And so I just want to set, so this is the purpose of the class. First thing I want you to know, art is a learnable skill. There's a myth that says, I'm not an artist. I'm not an artistic person. Really, the translation is, I don't care enough to improve, which is fine. It's nothing wrong with it. Um, I just want to establish that art is a learnable skill. There's an excellent book called Drawing on the Right Side of the Brain that is actually designed to help people that feel that are not artistic to get them thinking and just, I guess, being able to draw. So it's a really cool book and you can get it on Amazon. So the main principle with the book, one of the cool things they do, here's a picture of Salvador Dali, is take a portrait of someone, flip it upside down, and then start to sketch that person. And what that does is, normally when you're sketching right side up, you're gonna think about the nose, the eyes, and the ears, the mouth, maybe the mustache. But if you flip it upside down, it confuses your brain, and no longer are you referring to parts of this portrait as like an eye and an ear. Instead, you're more concerned about the contour of the drawing and all the various curves and angles because pretty much that's all a drawing is. It's just a collection of curves and lines and angles. So that is kind of the meat of the book, I would say. So let's see. Now let's talk about design. Design is about making life better and providing joy. So for thousands of years, we see evidence of human civilization using design to improve the world around them. Here you see uh, from all the way from the Great Pyramids, this is the Sphinx to Gothic architecture. This is a modern building. Here, this is Michelangelo and uh, this painting the Sistine Chapel. This is a cool car. All of this was created because of design. Ikea chairs and even Pee Wee Herman's Playhouse, which was my childhood favorite. A subset of design is graphic design. Graphic design is the process of visual communications. It's combining images, words, ideas to convey information to an audience to produce a special effect. So the graphic design, it's taking art and making it more functional, I guess you would say. It came about through the invention of the printing press. So around the early 1800s, there was advancements in the printing press and people had a way to communicate on a mass scale, you know, magazines and publications. And so here is a 1947 a cover of the New Yorker and as printing has continued to evolve, now we have sublimation printing where these printers can print on t-shirts directly. And that's exactly what Merch does. So this is where we're at. And so graphic design is probably more valuable today than it's ever been. One thing I want to discuss is the difference between art and graphic design 
this is kind of controversial. I just want to establish some sort of mental separation. Art is subject to interpretation. And I'm, when I mean art, I'm talking about fine art. With art, it invokes questions. It's open for debate. It is self-expression. The artist is expressing himself. And it's an act of freedom. Here's a picture of one of my favorite artists, Dolly, Salvador Dolly. And it's a surreal painting. I don't know what's going on. It's just this crazy thing that happened in his subconscious brain. And he put this together. It's cool, and everyone has their own interpretation of what this means. Graphic design, on the other hand, it sends the same message to everyone. And graphic design, it's meant to solve a problem. It's easily understood. It serves as a function, and it's, it has a purpose and a goal. So here's the cover of a magazine, Better Home and Gardens. is one of the most popular magazines in the United States. Obviously, this is a summer theme. They used ice cream to represent summer. Of course, they're gonna, they have an article on the, the flavor guide. The first thing you see here is chill out. Again, very simple message. They just want to communicate. This is the summer edition of Better Homes and Garden. So that's an example of graphic design. Now, t-shirts are funny. So fashion kind of goes with fine art. It's self-expression. T-shirts are kind of weird because there's like a mixture of both fashion and where people wear it for beauty, and then also kind of a sense of function. It's casual wear. People, you know, they might wear shirts on the weekends. You know, people wear shirts a lot more now than they did maybe 50, 60 years ago. And so T-shirts, I would say, is kind of, you know, I would say it's 80% graphic design and then 20% art. Of course, that varies, but here's a clear example of a shirt. This is taken from Gap a website. It sends the same message to everyone think of the future and it's got a little icon, a recycling icon. It's green. So you know that green is associated with recycling. You care about the environment. If someone cares very strongly about the environment, they want to express that. They want to broadcast that message any way possible. One way to do it is through a t-shirt. So it solves a problem. Person wants to express themselves, their love for the environment and the need for it. It's easily understood. So it's not open to interpretation. It's pretty self-explanatory. Serves as a function and a purpose and a goal. So this is, again, an example of graphic design on a t-shirt. Now, with art and graphic design, the big thing I want to establish is that we have the power to change the world around us. This is a screenshot of Minecraft, which is the top selling game of all time. As far as all games go, this is the greatest game and probably will be the greatest game of all time. It was valued at like $2 trillion. And so everyone knows this game, Minecraft. One of the things I love about this is on day one, you're thrown in this big empty world and you're filled with challenges. In about 15 minutes, it's going to get dark and you're going to get monsters come swarming at you. So if you can survive day one, by day two, you quickly learn to create something to survive. So the, in survival mode of Minecraft, you have to be creative to survive. And so that's kind of your existence. And eventually you start creating more things, you start building more weapons, and survival becomes a piece of cake. And at that point, you start just creating the world around you. Everything in Minecraft is a block. So it's just a collection of blocks. You can pick up a block and you can stack them just like Legos. And so as people play this, um, Catherine and I, we used to play this at night to relax. And uh, by day 1,000, yes, people play this for years. Here's the entrance to my stone castle. There's a pond, there's a waterfall, and a garden. Before you know it, you realize this is your world. This is, when you go to Minecraft, it's your world. You can do whatever you want with it. You can create whatever you want with it. What you see is, you know, is what you want to see. And so with graphics, with design, you have the power to change what you see around you. Look around you, the room you're in right now. Look at a wall or something. Okay, you have the power to change what you see. You can change the color of the wall. You can add a picture. You can move around furniture. It's your wall. It's your room. You can do what you want. Have that attitude as we go through this course and think about, okay, you can do what you want. You have the power. With that power, let's change the look of this t-shirt right here. We got a blank t-shirt. When you're selling on merch, all shirts start out blank and it's up to you to decide what is on that shirt. Now, before we can start creating, it's helpful to know the basic building blocks of design. This is known as the elements of design. Starting 
with a point. Just a single point, if you're on a computer, it's a pixel. By creating a collection of points and grouping them together, you can create a line. So you take a line, you can actually take a collections of lines and they create shapes. You can have shapes and add light and darkness to it, this is called value. And then you can add color to your shape. Then you can add texture to your shape and that eventually creates form. And that is the building blocks of design. There's one more thing I'd like to talk about with the elements of design and that's space. So this guy doesn't get a block because space is all around you. It's all this blackness is known as space. Another term for it is negative space. Very important in design is thinking about negative space. And I'm going to show you examples pretty soon. But one cool thing I've heard, uh, I believe it was Mozart. He said the most important thing in music is silence. And I thought about that and I was like, wow, silence, like just not playing at all. Mm, maybe, but I think really what he meant by that was that when you play a music, a pulse, you have a beat, and then there's a short silence, and then you play another sound. It's that gaps in between the sound that's the most important part. And so I would have to say with visual arts, space is very important. Okay, so here's the elements of design. Here are some examples of it. You have various lines. Lines can be wavy. They can, be, they can go at an angle. The thickness of lines can change. Color, here's a great example of color. And notice the lines, how they're kind of going out in a redial formation. So uh, <laughs> color. Here's an example of space and shape. So I love this because you see the cat is cuddling with the dog. That's a great use of negative space here. Basically, he just knocked out a part of the dog. The artist knocked out a part of the, the, the dog and created a cat in the center. And his face also uh, merges in. Again, that's great use of negative space there. And then value. Uh, here's a dog. You can see that from light to darkness or darkness to light. And then here's the FedEx logo, a great example of space and color. So you have two contrasting colors. You kind of have a cool color here and then a warm color here. And then also the cool thing about this with the X and the E is that there's a little arrow there. And that is kind of an amazing use of negative space there. It sends a subliminal message that FedEx, they're on the go. So that's really cool. And then this is texture. So let's go on. With the elements of design, you have the principles of design. Now, the principles of design is about organizing and arranging the elements of design. So we're going to take all these basic elements. You know, you got your, your point, your line, your shapes, uh, the color, the value, you know, all that good stuff. And we're going to combine them together. And by arranging them, that there is a set of principles called the principles of design. And these are ways that you can arrange the elements. So you have, I'm going to go these really quick and then we're going to go through all these in more detail. So you have balance, you have contrast, you have emphasis, pattern and repetition. You have unity and harmony. There's rhythm, there's a variety, there's scale, proportion, there's depth, there's hierarchy, there's movement, or what I like to call the flow. And then this is something that I added, the gestalt, and we're going to talk about this. Now, principles of design, there's a lot of variations of it. So if you go look this up and you'd be like, hey, this doesn't match what Isaac put together. I was taught one way in school and other people are taught another way in school. So I kind of like took all the elements of, that I know of design and kind of put this together. So this is kind of my own little curation of the principles of design. One thing I want to highlight, contrast. Okay, I made this on yellow at purpose because as we go through the principles of design, one thing I want you to think about is contrast, which in my opinion is probably the most important thing you can do. And by having contrast, you're actually going to cover a lot of the other principles. So that's why I have this highlighted here. One quick note about color is that yellow is actually considered brighter than white. So you have a black background, you know, and you have white, which is great contrast yellow will actually stand out more on top of white. So that's why I made this yellow, because I want to emphasize this. All right, so let's talk about balance. With balance, you have symmetrical. These two shirts right here, they're the exact same size, exact same color, and they're identical. With new graphic designers, with people that are barely getting into art, and you know, if they're more mathematical or analytical, they, our brains naturally want to mirror everything. 
The problem with mirror and everything is that that can make your designs appear boring and have a lack of flow. The other element of balance is asymmetrical. So that's where things are uneven. This can create flow, hierarchy, and emphasis. One way I thought about this is that think of it like a teeter-tot. And when you're on a teeter-tot, if you're level, that's really boring. Like, okay, we're just going to stand here and munch on sandwiches or something. No, when you're on a teeter-tot as a little kid, you want to go up and down. You want to be moving. That's where the fun is. And so when you think of balance, don't think of it as just being leveled. Think of it as a teeter-tot. You're kind of like, just kind of like bouncing. But if you go too much, you're going to fall and that's going to be horrible. And if you don't move, that's kind of boring. Also, walking on a tightrope, that's like another thing to think about balance. So have that in the back of your mind when you think about balance. So balance does not just mean just being even on a line. The other thing with balance is to understand visual weight. Here you have two t-shirts. One is bigger than the other. However, because this one is wider, it has more visual weight, which means your eye is going to draw attention to this white shirt versus this one. Now, even though this is scaled larger, if it's scaled large enough, it might trick your brain into like, okay, which one do I look at first? Like this is white, but then this is bigger. And in a way, you kind of can create symmetry by not understanding visual weight. So value and color have different visual weights. Another thing that has visual weights are eyes. Anything with the face, we tend to gravitate towards, so that has a lot of visual weight. So that's something to, to keep in mind with balance. And here's some example of balance on a t-shirt. So here's this cool kind of tribal art, weird geometric art symmetry. It's very balanced, and what happens on the left is happening on the right. Some people might we look at it and be like, whoa, that's cool. You know, you know, in the 90s, it was all cool to have tribal art. And then here's an example of design with an asymmetrical. This is a great use of color right here. They use the orange here to draw your attention, and then you can see all these other weird shapes and patterns. Monochromatic, the white kind of like drifting off. So your eye starts here, and it kind of gazes downward, and that creates a flow, and it kind of creates kind of a cool thing. Now, one thing I would say is that if you took this white part out and you just had this orange thing here, it would look kind of weird because you would just have this big orange blob. So what the white does, it kind of creates a sense of balance, that kind of teeter-tot. So that's one of the cool things about this, this specific asymmetrical design. Now, contrast. Again, contrast, I think, super, super important. There are different ways that you can have contrast in a design. There's value. So here you have something that's really light versus something that's really dark. These two shirts, obviously different. Another way to create contrast is by size. You can have something really large and then something really small. Color. So color is another use. Uh, here you have this vibrant red. And you'll see a reoccurring theme that you see in design a lot. Is people use red to really get your attention. And so that's what we're doing here. And then you kind of have this dark muted blue. Again, clearly contrast. Another way is focused. So this is out of focused and this is in focused. So that's another way to represent it. There's a lot of ways to represent. You can do it with shape and we'll go on, but I just want you to think about that contrast. Now, the night watch. Let's take a little bit of an art history here. Rembrandt is probably one of the greatest Renaissance painter of his age, and he is considered the master of light or contrast. Okay, so during the Renaissance era, these people were painting. They're trying to make it as lifelike as possible. They all did an amazing job. But one thing that you see prior to Rembrandt was that it was really flat and muted. Rembrandt came on board and he started adding a lot of contrast, which huge separation of light and darkness. And so you really see that in this, the night watch. So here, the first thing that show up are these two guys. They're kind of yin and yang. You got to, you know, this guy's really dark. This guy's all white. However, this guy, his face is white. So there's a lot of contrast on his face. So his face stands out more. This guy, even though he's brighter and is white, you think he would stand out more, but his face kind of blends in with his clothing. So you don't really take notice of him, not as much as you do with this guy. This guy is obviously the guy in charge. This guy, he's like second in charge. And so it's a great use of contrast. Also, you can see a shadow here, which is really cool. That was like cutting edge back then, was like adding like these little detailed shadows. And so it's really cool. So you see there's like a little bit of red here. This guy has red 
this guy's wearing red. That kind of creates balance with the two red. Again, this is white here, white there, another form of balance. And one thing he did was he used light to establish a flow. So what we're going to do is let's walk through all the faces and see what happens. So here's this guy's face. He's kind of looking in this direction. You got this guy's face, this guy's face, this guy's face. And then let's go down here. We go here. Boom. Ends up here. What's this guy? This guy's kind of holding a flag. You look at his face. He's going here. You see this thing? Okay, your eye's going to follow there. Goes back here. Boom. This guy's face is going there. If we were to look at this guy, you know, he's kind of going there. Let's travel along. Oh, he's pointing in this direction. What's he pointing at? This guy's mustache. No, he's going down. Okay, this guy's kind of looking very intensely with this gun. We go here. Go back to his face. Boom. Everything goes back to this guy's face. And so he used light to establish a flow. So I thought that was really cool. Okay, the next thing is contrast. And like I said, you know, the light and darkness creates contrast. Here's an example of contrast on a shirt. This is a polygon style artwork. It's, it's kind of a popular thing right now. I think it's becoming even more popular. And it's basically using geometric shapes to create a scene or some type of imagery. And so here, there's a lot of contrast going on. You see there's a lot of mountains here. All the mountains are triangles. And then you see the circle here, which is like the sun or the moon. You see a contrast of shapes. Here, you see this mountain, and then you see one in front of it. And there's a huge contrast between dark brown and light beige. And then in front of that mountain is a bear, which again is repeating this dark brown. And that is even more contrast. So now there's kind of a horizon line here. And I'm thinking this is like water or an ocean because it tends to be a reflection of what's happening up here. So here you can see the bear, you can see his reflection, and he's using contrast again to show the reflection of the bear. And then you kind of see these, these mountains again. Now, if I was to design this or someone that's not like a trained artist, I might take this mountain and copy it, flip it upside down and put it down here. There, that's my reflection. But what they did was they actually squished it. So these mountains are a lot shorter than these mountains. And that kind of represents showing that these mountains are further away. And also it creates another sense of contrast. You have really long triangles, you have really short triangles. So I kind of want to show you just all the various forms of contrast that are just in this image alone. Awesome. So now we're going to go with emphasis, another principle of design. So here's emphasis. Here you can see there's a row of shirts. They're all kind of muted and faded. And then you see this one that's super bright. That is emphasis. That is the thing you want to look at. And again, they're using con I'm, I'm using contrast to show emphasis. Here, you can show emphasis with size. So it's the same concept, but instead we're making this shirt larger. And then here we're using color. These are all kind of a dark blue, and then you see red here. And then here we're using focus. So these kind of look like they're in the background, and this guy's just kind of floating in front of you. This is what you want to look at. And this is used in photography a lot, this depth of field. And so that creates emphasis. Emphasis can also use scale, rotation, and size. So here, this guy, he's a little bit larger. He's kind of rotating. And so this guy, he stands out compared to these two. Now, back to art history. <laughs> I love this story so much. Okay, so in New York, around the early 1900s, there was an art gallery. At the time, there was a bunch of art snobs, and they were all like really picky on who can have a gallery or not. And they wanted to open it up to the public. So they had an art gallery in New York and they said, okay, just pay us $6 and you can have an art exhibit. And we want to open this up to everyone. So uh, this guy Duchamp, he goes, all right, cool. He shows up and he takes a urinal. Yes, a regular urinal at the time, flips it on his side and signs it R. Mutt 1917. Boom, that's my art. And the people were like, what the heck is this? This is not art. He said, yeah, it's ready-made art. And uh, actually, the museum and the art gallery, they denied its exhibit, and it created a huge controversy. This simple act, they say, completely changed art history and the way people perceived art. So Rembrandt was a master of light. I would say this guy was the master of controversy. Now, something about this guy. He isn't some, like, goofball that came off off the street. <laughs> hey, I'm going to put a urinal here. No, he was... An actual artist. You can look him up. His name is Duchamp. This guy is right up there with Picasso. Like this guy can draw. So he knew what he was doing. And I really thought about this. And I think the biggest thing he did was emphasis. So imagine yourself walking in this art gallery. 
beautiful art, beautiful art, beautiful art, toilet, beautiful art. Wait, what? Someone put a toilet here? What the heck? And, you know, it was a simple magic formula. You just place something where it doesn't belong. That creates emphasis. That's what this guy did. And because of this act, it, it caused, you know, hysteria in the art community. People to this day are still arguing over whether it's art or not. I don't know if he even cares. Look at him. He's just sitting down smoking a cigarette. Yeah, I did my thing and walked away. And he called it the fountain, which is excellent taste, as you can imagine. Here's another example of emphasis. This is done as a meme. You may have seen this before. When I saw this, this made me laugh so much. Thank you all for, not you, being powerful black women. Okay, not you. What? She doesn't belong there. For you, those of you that don't know, this is Rachel Denzel. She's a huge activist. And uh, she went around telling everyone she was African-American. Her mother came out and says, no, she's white. She's blonde hair, blue eyes, white girl. I don't know why she thinks she's black. And people are like, what? You're what? And she, she like owned it. She's really cool. She's like, well, I'm black in my heart. So this is kind of a funny meme. Okay, thank you all for being beautiful black women, but not you. <laughs> so again, it brings emphasis. And I've seen like about 100 variations of these. This is, a, a, again, it's like a magic formula meme. So, and here's emphasis on a t-shirt, going back to t-shirts. So here we have the anapromorphic animals here. You got this human body and the tie in a suit with the dog head. The, the creator here, they wanted to emphasize, hello, there's dogs on these heads. These people have dog heads, so they used color. So everything's black and white, and then they used color to draw your attention to the dog heads. So that's a form of emphasis on graphic design on a t-shirt. So, and then here's more examples of emphasis. This is something that we saw at TJ Maxx. It's, it's a, a picture, and it has these beautiful illustrations of uh, various cameras, and they wanted you to bring, they wanted to bring emphasis to the lenses. So here in the center of the lens, you see a heart. Everything's kind of this, this black and white monochromatic, and then you see this colorful heart. And then here you see a rainbow. I think this is a sun. Here's butterflies flying out, a heart, heart, heart. And you can see how by using contrast, they're able to bring emphasis to this design. Here's a t-shirt I saw at Target. I thought it was really cute. And, you know, it's like a little fairy with the, a carriage and a castle. And what they did was they used color to bring emphasis to certain elements. Here, she's got a pink dress. She's got a pink bow, pink shoes. And then the, the carriage is pink. And then the tops of the castle is pink. And so that it, it creates a sense of flow, balance, but also... in emphasis on this little girl right here. Now, they could have turned this road pink. This whole road could have been pink, but that would have drawn your own attention to it. And they're like, yeah, this road's here, but don't pay attention. This is really what you want to look at here. So that's, again, a sense, a form of emphasis. Here, okay, I saw about 10 of these. This is like a thing. People are into this. This is a hedgehog with geeky glasses in the front. And so they wanted you to know, hey, look at this hedgehog. He's got geeky glasses. So they turn the glasses red and the hitchhog black and white. Again, you bring emphasis to the glasses. People think it's cute. It's kind of cool looking. And I saw this over and over again. Here's, here's a dog. He's got the red hipster glasses. So, you know, if you're looking for a t-shirt idea, go pick a random animal, find a public domain or draw one yourself, make them black and white, and then put red glasses on it. Somebody somewhere is probably going to love it. So moving on from emphasis, we have pattern. Pattern is just, it's repetition of, of elements or of placement. You see this a lot on fashion and also, you know, t-shirts. So with patterns, you can experiment with size and shape and, and spacing. I show this to uh, our 14-year-old and she saw this and she goes, yeah, they're too close together. It makes me kind of irritable. I don't like this. She saw this and was like, this makes me feel a lot better. Why? Because there's more negative space. There's more breathing room. It creates more harmonious effect. And so when you, when you spread these out, people, they like repeating elements. And I'm going to repeat that throughout this course. People like repetition. You know, this can be used to create texture or control visual weight. So that's pattern. And then here's some examples of pattern in the fashion world. Here you see a dress with hearts on it. They're kind of muted, but it creates a nice pattern. Here is a t-shirt with these kind of cool characters on it. Notice the spacing. There's a big spacing here. And then here's another one with Dotson's a pattern. One thing I want to note about this pattern is that they use three different colors, the red, white, and blue, and then there's like a light blue in the background. 
The red draws your attention. So I think the red is on the foreground. The next thing would be probably the blue. And then you see this kind of scattered white and then on top of this light blue. So the artist here used color to create kind of depth within this pattern because if all the dogs were red, it would be too striking and might seem kind of irritable. However, the fact that he's using colors and like there's a huge contrast of the colors, it creates this kind of breathing room. So you look at this pattern, okay, that breathes. Look at this kind of pattern, that breathes, and then that. So just kind of show you how the use of color created a more harmonious effect for this design pattern. So back to art history, really cool stuff here. This is a painting by Picasso. Now, Picasso, he's probably the most renowned modern day painter of our era. He was a prodigy at a young, he was a prodigy, and by the time he was a young teenager, he mastered the art style of Rembrandt. So he was able to take what Rembrandt did and take it to a whole nother level. And so one of the things he evolved into, he had a lot of different phases, was cubism. And cubism is this sense of, it's this art where you use abstract shapes and kind of, I guess, a sense of pattern. You know, you might see like triangles or squares and to create art. And here is a picture. This was one of his first cubism paintings of, uh, these are prostitutes in France. And you can see here. Now, typically someone, you know, a Renaissance painter would have made this more realistic. He went in an opposite direction where he kind of messed around with the shape and the, the form of these girls, but at the same time, it still identify that these are one, two, three, four, five girls in the picture. Now, this started a whole art movement called Cubism. Fast forward 10 years later, we're in France, and the World War I is happening, and uh, the France army commissioned a collection of artists to work on a project they called Camouflage. And the problem was that there was an advancement in military weapons, so the guns were getting better, and their, their form of fighting had to change to adapt for this upgraded military technology. So this guy, Mayer, he was sketching out this idea of camouflage. Again, he's, he's a cubist artist. He's using cubism and watercolors to come up with this concept. This eventually led to modern-day camouflage as we know it. So it's a really cool story. I just want to show you how fine art and how it changes in the style, it really, how it really affects our culture. And now, I mean, can you imagine a world without camouflage? Like if you went 200 years ago, hey, can I have a, you guys have any camouflage around here? They're going to look at you and be like, what? But it's like second nature to us. So it's a really cool thing, a little art history there. Now we're going on to unity. Unity creates harmony. And so here are some examples of unity in design. Again, we have these collection of shirts. They're all different sizes, but what unites them is color. Here you have a collection of shirts. They have different colors, but they're all the same size. So that's what unites the shirts. Here you have shirts, they're different colors, different sizes, but they're all aligned at the base. So the unity is alignment. Here you have shirts, they're rotating in different directions, but they're all the same shape. So, you know, if you create a design, think about unity. Okay, what unites? What, what's one element that unites the entire piece together? So again, people like repetition. Repetition and unity can be used to theme a design. So, you know, if, if, you're doing, if you're going with a Hawaii theme, maybe you have pineapple, you know, that's the theme. So you're going to have little repetition or little elements of pineapple, and that kind of unites everything together. So that's just one idea of how to use unity. And here's unity in action. Here's a t-shirt. Again, we found at Target. I thought it was really cool. If your dreams don't scare you, they aren't big enough. What's cool about this, every line has different font. And here you see a uh, display fonts and a decorative fonts. It's actually what it's called. So you got like a little snake here. Here you have an eye kind of looking at you really excited. And then big, every letter looks like a little monster. And so what unites this, this picture or this image is the pink. So even though they're different fonts, there's unity because they're all pink. Here's another display. This is something we found at TJ Maxx you see wash, brush, flush, flush. It's all different colors, but what unites this is they're all using the same font. So that's a sense of unity. And then here, this is a $60 backpack we saw at Whole Foods. It might be cheaper now that Amazon owns them. Hey, here you see patterns. It's kind of crazy. It looks a bit chaotic, but what unites them is this black and white. All the animals are black and white. You see a little bit of green. And then again, you see this kind of red as accent. 
it's, it's done really well to create balance, but not too intense. It's not too intense. So uh, here it's a good use of color for Unity. Next, we have rhythm in design. So think of rhythm as you would think of it as the visual representation of musical rhythm. So here, da, 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 da. And this is the use of space. You can create rhythm with space. Here you can create rhythm with value, which is the difference between light and dark. And then here we're creating rhythm with blue. So we, uh, on the color wheel, we are taking the cool colors, which are like blue to green are considered cool colors. And then the opposite, red and orange are considered warm colors. So these are cool colors, variations, and we're creating rhythm with that. It can be used to create motion and direct the eyes. So again, here is, uh, you can kind of see this rhythm. It's in a secular, circular pattern, but then at the same time, it's kind of directing your eyes outwards. So that's an example of rhythm. Now, here is rhythm in a painting, and this guy rocks. This is probably the best example. Gustav Klimt. These are two paintings he created in 1907. This one's called The Kiss, and he loved gold. And so you look at these black blocks here, and you can see there's a sense of a rhythm, and eventually the black blocks get more scattered apart as you go down the painting. So that's one use of rhythm. Here you can see this cluster of green and uh, they start to kind of, the spacing gets bigger and bigger as you go down here. There's just rhythm all over the place. Here you see triangles or uh, squares and then the squares get smaller and further away, a sense of rhythm. Here you see these like dots, these squares here, they get more further away. So again, it's, this is rhythm in action. By the way, this is 1907. So all this guy's work is in public domain. Hey, so you can use this stuff. Pretty cool. Okay, so we just, principles of design, we know for balance, contrast, emphasis, pattern and repetition, unity and harmony and rhythm. Now, going back to rhythm, so you might look at this and be like, eh, this is too boring. I want a sense of variety. The next thing is variety. And what I want to show you here, I took this piece of rhythm, a bunch of shirts, and I just deleted a few of them. And by deleting a few of them, I created a Variety. Variety can change the shape of negative space and add visual appeal. So you, you, you're going to mix things up a bit. So here you can, you see a lot more negative space going on here. And this is a use of variety. So this is variety in action. Here's some shirts here. So we'll start with this one. Buzz off. Here's a cool, cool little pun going on with the little bee. Someone who's starting with graphic design would just make this all the same color, either black or gold. However, by changing this from black to gold, you created a sense of variety. Also, it matches the pattern on the bumblebee, so it kind of also creates a bit of unity. So that's to show you how to make something interesting. Just change the color of something. Here you see a heart. It's actually a collection of triangles, and they're all different color, but they're clumped together to create a heart. And again, the variety here is the color. Here, I don't know what's going on here. It's just a bunch of icons. Yeah, this is definitely a variety. Someone might look at this and be like, oh my gosh, this is like my brain, like just all kinds of stuff going on. So that's the appeal there. Here is another sense of variety. They took, actually, this is a variety of value. So it's all pink. Here is a light pink and a dark pink, light pink, dark, dark. And you know, they didn't create a rhythm. They definitely had it. So it's just kind of a variety of it. So that's another example. And again, another example of variety with color. So a lot of people, I know they, they want to like, oh, I wish I had better typography. I need a better font. The big issue I see with designs is the use of fonts. All these principles of design, the same rules that apply to shapes and, and simple patterns also apply to fonts. And this is a perfect example of that there. So I just want you to think about that. If you're looking at fonts, you think it's too boring, look at the principles of design and think about what can you do to change things up a bit. So uh, the next thing is scale. So the principles of design here, you have scale. This is obviously a small shirt. Maybe it's for a kid, maybe for a teenager, and then a large adult. Scale can cause comparison and proximity can be used to communicate size. Can be used to bring emphasis and control negative space and tell a story. So let's look at some examples of scale. So in a shirt, here's a cool picture I saw of dinosaurs. Dinosaurs are great for scale. So here, obviously, this guy right here is the largest dinosaur. So it's a, you know, a comparison. In fact, what you can do, you can put like a little person there, and that's going to make them look super huge just by putting a little person there. 
And so that's a sense of scale. Here's another sense of scale. So you have this, it's called City Girl. And you see this girl, she just went shopping and she's got her, her little cat there. Obviously, she's a lot bigger than her cat. And then you look at the background and you see these little cars here and this big building. So the cars here kind of show you that, whoa, this is like a big city going on. And she's like rocking it. She just went to the big city and she's got all her clothes and she's loving life. And she's got a little kit here too with holding a phone, it looks like. Uh, so that's a, a scale in action. And with scale, the next thing is depth. <laughs> so here, uh, I'll start with this one. This is in the background. He's, it's smaller and it's darker. And then you have this guy who's in front of this guy. He's a little bit brighter. I made him a little bit bigger. And then you have this guy in the front of these three. He's brighter and bigger. And then you have this guy, like super, like right in your face t-shirt. So with depth, you need a background and foreground. So two elements, background and foreground. Background elements tend to be muted and faded. And then the foreground elements are more vibrant and popping and strong. So again, like, like red tends to always be in the front. So this is an example of depth. Now this is awesome. This is taken from a book called How to Draw Comics, The Marvel Way. And this is a, an exercise of good versus better. Um, there's actually YouTube videos. You go on, you can Google this. Go on YouTube and Google How to Draw Comics. And this was actually taken. These are screenshots taken from a YouTube video. So let's start with here. So here you have a guy. He's like smoking a cigar. Hello. Now, this is okay. But according to Marvel, this is better. Whoa. He's like in your face going, hey. What's going on? So this is showing you depth. This has a greater sense of depth. Here, you have two guys talking. He's just like, oh, I don't know, something's going on. And this guy's like, mm-hmm, mm -hmm. Here is a greater sense of depth. They're saying this is better. This guy is obviously in charge, and this guy is obviously being scolded. So, it, and the other neat thing is that this establishes a relationship and a hierarchy. This guy's the boss. Here um, is another example of, of depth. This guy, I'm going to attack you, giant monster. This is like David and Goliath. I know you're a hundred times my size, but I'm going to take you down. So it really shows you that here. Here, these guys, this is superheroes running with friends. You know, obviously the person can draw, it's proportion, everything's correct, but this is better. This is more dramatic. Hey, we're getting ready to take care of some stuff. Here, these guys are like, oh no, what's going on? Here, these guys are like, they're in the middle of battle. And this depth here, he's in the front. Uh, Captain America is in the middle, and I don't know who this dude is. He's in the back. It also creates a sense of flow, too. So it's a night use of depth. Yes, that's really good, Marilyn. The good ones are taking action. Yes. Uh, here's a monster. He's coming in like the Kool-Aid man. Hey, guys. And then here's another version at a different angle, like death and destruction is upon you. And so just to show you angles and a greater sense of depth. Uh, you got Dr. Doom here. He looks menacing. They just kind of tilted him and then also changed his posture to make it more menacing. The other thing I want to say is that one thing I see is that what tells the better story. So graphic design is about communicating. You want the message to be as clear and as simple as possible. So like this guy right here, he's kind of like, is he angry? Is he happy? Is he like, what, like what, what's his emotion here? This right here, he's like, he's ready to pound his hand on the table. So according to Marvel, this is a much better picture than this. And then this is it in action as a t-shirt. So depth in action. Here I'm showing you depth. This is a picture of Sailor Moon, a popular anime cartoon. And she is obviously Sailor Moon. She's the person in the front. And then she's got her posse in the back. An amateur you know, artist might take these and make them all the same size and put them in line, which is cool. I mean, that, there's nothing wrong with that. But here... They're able to have them full size and they kind of squish them together on a t-shirt and you establish a sense of depth. Here's Wolverine. A really cool thing you can do for action is called breakout. So here you see a frame and Wolverine, he breaks out of that frame and it's really subtle. I mean, it's not like, you know, he didn't actually, it's just a little portion of them breaks through. And so that creates a sense of depth and also like kind of like more intense. Here's My Little Pony. My Little Pony tends to be flat. A lot of the t-shirts, there is no depth. But here, they use typography as a perspective. So it's kind of like coming out you. And that establishes a sense of depth. And so you're kind of more focused on the ponies. Um, here's another picture of Sailor Moon. I love this. But again, you have the background, this light, 
in front of the background and then a silhouette of her, she's obviously in front of you. And then they used red as like the color accent. So that created a sense of depth. Spider-Man is the king of depth. I mean, he's so, his angles, again, this is obviously in front of you, this is behind you. And so when a little kid looks at Spider-Man, their initial reaction is to mirror him because he's just so animated and his movements are so cool that kids, and this is part of the appeal of Spider-Man is the way they draw him and the angles they chose. Here's Wolverine. This is a classic Wolverine picture here. You see these lines in front of him that creates a sense of motion. And also he's just slashing his way through Wolverine. Here's one of my favorite artists, a comic book artist. His name is David Mack. And this is, he does watercolor. And so this is kind of a subtle way of depth here. Uh, it's just a, you know, a cat and you see the cat in front of you and then his tail's kind of in the background. So I just want to show you another form of depth. Now with depth, the next thing is hierarchy. So you can establish a scent of hierarchy in your designs and to, for a better communication. So here's a sense of value. Here we have from light to dark. Again, this one has the biggest contrast. So this one is going obviously has a higher hierarchy and then it goes down the pole. Here, the level, okay, with hierarchy, you can have a level of importance and direct the user's eyes. So here, if you were to look at this, your eyes would bounce here, here, here. This is larger. This obviously has the, the higher hierarchy. And then here you can do it through color. Again, it comes back to contrast. The more contrast, the, the, the more emphasis you're establishing hierarchy. Warm colors tend to pop more. What are warm colors? They're reds, yellow, and orange. They tend to pop out more. And then blue, green colors tend to be, they tend to not pop out. So they tend to be in the background. And I think the reason for that is, you know, if you look at nature, the sky is blue. Then you look at nature, you have everything's green, which are cool colors. And then like you look at a ladybug and it's red, it's right in front of you. So that's kind of showing you. Also, another thing to establish hierarchy is value. So how intense is that color? When you're playing with color, you can have a beautiful color palette. Suppose you get an image, you upload it to Sky Palette using Tangent, and you have your color palette. And then you start putting your designs together. And you're like, I love these colors, but for some reason, something's not happening in my design. A lot of the times, it's because there's not a variation of value. And from light to darkness, from vibrant to muted. And so if you have a color palette, not only are those the colors you use and that you're going to confine yourself to, but also think about value and vibrancy with your colors. And th again, it goes back to creating contrast. So this is a scene of hierarchy. And what I wanted to do, I wanted to change the least amount of things to establish a better flow in this design. Oh, Lisa, is there a rule of thumb? Try to incorporate X amount of principles in the design. I came to conclusion, me personally, I try, try to intersect as many as possible. You know, don't overdo it. Think of these as just tools to improve your design, to make it better. And, and so as far as a rule of thumb, you can just focus on one thing, do it well, or you can mix and match two of them, or maybe you want to do all of them. It's really up to you. And it's really up to the design. Let the design dictate what's needed. If you look at it and it's not doesn't have the emphasis, that pop, that emotional draw that you wish it did, go back to the principles of design and start adding more of those principles till it gets to where you need it to be. So that's what I would have to say about that. Now, going back to hierarchy, I wanted to establish flow. And with this, this slide here and change the least amount of things possible, this is what I did. So here I took out what wasn't needed and I just moved a couple of shirts around. And by doing this, I established a sense of flow to direct the user's eyes. So here, this shirt, he's tilted so it looks like an arrow. He's kind of pointing here. You see white, he's going down here. Size, going down here, and then here, and then there. So I established a sense of flow. Now, what separates great graphic design to just okay graphic design is flow. If you look at every high-end agency, um, I used to work for a company called P11 and they were just like these really high-end graphic design firm. And all the artwork that I noticed when I was working there, they had flow, some sense of flow. And they're using the principles of design to direct the user's eyes. Of course, that's because they want to send a message, whether it be typography or design elements to the viewer. 
So that's something to think about is flow. Now, going back to the principles of design, we covered balance, contrast, emphasis, pattern, repetition, unity, harmony, rhythm. And again, these are all just kind of think of these as spices. So if you're in cooking in the kitchen, you know, you might want to put all the spices in, or maybe you just need one or two spices. And that's kind of how you kind of got to view these principles of design. They're there to improve your design, to make it better. So the end goal is you have the best communication possible. Variety, scale, proportion. We have depth, hierarchy, movement, flow. Okay. Nothing in art is arbitrary. Going back to fine art, the more you learn about art, the more you really study of it, the more you learn nothing is arbitrary. Everything has a structure. There is a balance of light and dark, direction and a story. A beginning, a middle, and an end. Okay, going back to Picasso. In 1937, Picasso was commissioned to do a painting. He didn't really take it seriously. He was like, whatever. And then there was a bombing in Spain. And this really, really affected him. And he felt compelled to draw this painting called Guernica. And it was the city that was bombed. And he used his style of cubism. And this is probably one of his greatest piece of art. And we'll start with here. Here you see a bull. I believe the bull represents the Spanish people. Here is a woman holding a dead baby. Very powerful imagery, again, in the style of cubism. Here you see a woman dead on the ground. Here's a horse. He's just kind of running for his life. Here you see an eyeball and kind of light shining on everything. Here's a woman. She's running out of a building, I believe, that's on fire. I think that's what's happening. And she's holding a candle. She's running. Here's a woman just in pain and suffering. And then here's a woman. She is dying. And so this is a portrait of pain and a horror of war. This is a, it was a very strong painting at the time. So now you look at this and you're like, wow, this is really weird. Like this is, I don't, I don't get it. Okay. Picasso is considered a master artist and he knew what he was doing. He used something in fine art that the great masters use called dynamic symmetry. And uh, this was used in a lot of the fine art. Rembrandt, you know, would use this and he incorporated this, incorporated this in his cubism. So what you see here are five panels. And then here, there's like a collection of intersects. I'm not going to go into detail with this. I just want you to know that these artists, they, there's a lot more going on than meets the eye. A lot of math going on here. So this is really kind of really cool and just kind of change. I just wanted to kind of change your perspective on fine art and uh, just art in general. And that, again, it goes back to everything has structure. Seem chaotic, but actually it's not. Okay, now let's talk about Andy Warhol. <laughs> the more I learn about this guy, the more I'm like, this guy was way ahead of his time. So he challenged what commercial art is versus fine art. He went to art school. He was better than all his peers. You know, he can actually draw. He had really good talent. He spent the first part of his career as a graphic designer, creating the covers for magazines. And then he decided he wanted to get into fine art. His first thing he did was uh, he went to someone and he goes, I don't know what to draw. So he paid, him, he paid the person $50 and the person goes, what do you love? He goes, well, I love Campbell's soup and I love money. So boom, he drew a picture of Campbell's soup. And uh, he actually, he drew this picture of Campbell's soup. He put it in an art gallery. He actually drew a collection of them and laid them out in a row as if they're like in the middle of an aisle on a shopping mall. And one thing about Warhol was that he stopped looking at nature and embraced the industrial age. He used what he called the mundane for a subject, something as simple as a Campbell soup. This is kind of his start of uh, his popularity in the fine art community was Campbell, was drawing these Campbell soups. Another thing he did was when Marilyn Monroe died, he felt, you know, it really hit him. So he wanted to turn her into a cultural icon or to magnify her even more. So he created this painting of Marilyn. He did something that was a bit controversial at the time. Because of his history in graphic design, he knew about silk printing. So he actually used silk printing to create his art. And a lot of people were like, wait a minute, you're like, that's not fine art. Like fine art is when you 
oil on canvas and there's only one of a kind. He, you, he said, no, I mean, he used silk screening and he did it for mass reproduction and he would just want it to change the way art was. In a lot of ways, he's mirroring the age, the industrial revolution. This is how he set it up in a gallery. Here's the original film that he did. So a lot of people's like, he didn't even draw Marilyn. He just took a picture of her, changed her color, and then took a silk screen and just printed, mass produced her. So, and this is it. Uh, he's most famous for saying that in the future, everyone would be famous for 15 minutes. He loved video. He actually, like, he has a video of him just eating a hamburger. So I feel like he was a precursor to YouTube. This is going to make sense in a minute. I just wanted you to understand pop art, Andy Warhol, very different from Picasso. Now, let's go back to today. We live in a digital age. Everything is accessible. There is a continuous stream of communication. And because of that, what's happening digitally is starting to reflect what's, what's happening physically. So the digital world is starting to show up in the physical world. And here's some manifestation of it. Here's a shirt that just says chill. It's using the Netflix style logo. Obviously, when you look at this, you know Netflix and chill. Everyone knows this that lives in the digital age. Here's another one, friend zone. They're using this, the common thing people do is the heart and then the thumb. So it's like this guy, I love you. And the girl's like, yeah, you're all right. Well, friend zone. So <laughs> there. Here is a great use of emojis telling a story with a strong emotional reaction. You know, the batteries are dying. You see emoji changing. And then when he charges, he's happy again. So one of the things I see happening in this digital age is uh, simplicity, familiarity. You want to make things instantly identifiable. You want a quick emotional reaction. And I think when it comes to designing t-shirts, I think these are, these are definitely things to think about. Simplicity, familiarity, instantly identifiable, and a quick emotional reaction. Here's a backpack we saw at the store. I thought this was really clever. And they're kind of using this kind of like, oh my God, and uh, this like, kind of like clip art on a backpack. This is something you might see on, you know, on an Instagram or maybe a Facebook, these little elements here. Uh, stickers is the word I'm looking for. And here it's placed on a backpack. Another thing is uh, you look at the iPhone. This is the first set of iPhone icons from 2010. And you can look, like I said, anything you see online, just that is look for inspiration on what to do in for your print on demand products, a t-shirt, whatever it is you're, you're making here. And then here's the iPhone icons in 2017. And you can see that there's an evolution of design. Again, things are becoming bigger and simple. The challenge for Apple is that they need these icons. They need to communicate what they are as quickly as possible. Without a doubt, you know what this is. And so you can see the changes. Here, this was really interesting. The iPhone, the camera icon was originally, it was meant to look like a lens. Now, here, it's just a camera and instantly identifiable. Another quick note I want to make about this is that when the iPhone first came out, the design, they wanted to take real world elements and material and bring them into the phone so that you felt like you were touching something physical. Even though it's a flat screen, they wanted you to mentally think about texture, think about patterns, think about physical objects. This is when the iPhone first came out. Fast forward 10 years later, we are now living in this crazy digital age where everything's accessible. Now what's happening is that they can drop trying to mirror the physical world. And now they just got to think from a pure abstract level, what is the quickest and most effective way to communicate to you? And what's happening is the changes that they've made, this is now going to reflect back to the physical world. So I call this vocal reflection. How people communicate digitally is eventually reflected in physical products. So people have been communicating using emojis for quite a few years. It was just a matter of time before that form of communication is reflected onto physical products. So think about how you communicate with people. Think about the words you say. Think about how when you read things, think about how people are communicating to you. Use that as inspiration for your designs, for your t-shirt designs. And so in the digital age. So in this digital age, what type of problems exist today? 
People, they stare at their phones and ignore their friends and loved ones. Catherine and I, we have a game. We go out to eat. We try to find as many people that are not talking to each other and just staring at our phone. And we have the saying, people not talking to people. And so looking at your phone in certain social situations can be considered rude. Do you strongly agree or disagree? No, seriously, people, do you think when you're in a public place, when you're hanging out with friends, do you think it's rude to look at your phone? Okay, Marilyn agrees. Beverly agrees. Nicole agrees. Rick's like, well, it depends. Judas is like, everyone's like, yeah. Okay. Pick a point of view. It, there's, no, there's no right and wrong. Pick a point of view and emphasize it. Make it strong. Now, with that point of view, tell the story with your, tell a story with your point of view. What is the simplest and quickest way you can visually tell that story. You don't like when people are using their phones in public areas. How would you communicate that visually? Not for an ER doctor on call. <laughs> Thanks, Catherine. Yeah, there's always exceptions, and this is great. This is, this is great because that you, can, you can communicate that visually. You know, these are the challenges of a graphic designer. I present, you're a graphic designer. I give you this challenge, and it's your job to create something visually that communicates this story. Pics of phones watching people. <laughs> okay, this is, this is great stuff. You guys have some great, two people sitting at a table, one taking out, one taking a hammer to the phone, other person's phone. That's great, Barbara. That's a funny story. You guys are starting to get this. This is awesome. Pics of phones, people watching people. A big phone, obviously separating two people. That's really great, Ollie. And whatever you create, the decision, the solution that you came up with, show it to people and see what kind of reaction they have. If they have a quick and a strong reaction, then you know you have a good design piece. <laughs> I'm loving this. A Berlin wall between two people made of phones. You guys are awesome. A couple at a table, backs to each other texting. You know, Catherine, I have literally seen that. <laughs> a Thanksgiving dinner with no phone symbol. Yeah, this is, this is really cool. You guys are getting it. And so as a graphic designer, it's your job to figure out how to put that imagery together. So you can go to maybe go to Pixabay, go to Pexels, look for public domain art and figure out how you can create a collage of this art to tell that story. If you can draw, draw it. Maybe you want to pay someone, go on Fiverr. So the important thing is that you have this idea, the concept, and you know how you're going to communicate this visually. A fishbowl with phones in the water on the dinner table. <laughs> wow, you guys are coming up with some great ideas. A person and, and a phone user anonymously meeting saying, my name is, and I'm always on the phone. Wow, these are really, you guys have come up with some great ideas here. Okay, so I'm going to move on. Now we're back to Gestalt. The principles of design are actually based off a theory and philosophy called the Gestalt. So the theory goes that the whole is other than the sum of the parts. A lot of people like to say is greater, but the correct term is other. It's a theory on how we see the world. So if going back to the heart, I showed you an image earlier of a bunch of triangles that were clumped together to make a heart. That is an example of the Gestalt theory. So when things are grouped together, we tend to look at that and look at the greater whole. And that imagery does not really represent what's really happening. It's our own mental idea of what's going on here. And this will make sense in a minute. Figure ground, foreground motion. Okay, so with the Gestalt theory, Things in the background tend to be static, and things in the foreground, things in front of you, we expect to be moving. And so that's part of the gestalt. Proximity, similarity, and closure. Can you tell me what this is right here? Everyone knows it's a white t-shirt. You know, I am only showing you one-fourth of the shirt, but yet you instantly know it's a shirt. Your brain right now is mentally putting this whole thing together, knowing that this is part of a shirt. Now, this shirt can actually have a big bullet hole. It can have a big coffee stain on it. You never know. In your mind, this whole thing is white. And that is the gestalt in action. Here, I, I actually, I broke up the shirt into separate pieces because they're close together. Proximity, you glue it together to create a shirt. Here's another shirt. I just punched a bunch of square holes in it. Your brain puts this together to form the pieces. And then the law of past experience. So we talked about repetition. Part of the gestalt is people's past experiences. They're going to rely on what they know in their memory to, to conclude what they see in front of them. 
Here is a silhouette of a shirt. I broke it up pieces, yet your brain puts it together to say that that's a shirt. Part of the gestalt is a term called pragnaz, and that, is a, that means we seek to simplify everything. We're constantly looking to make sense of the world around us. And so here's another form of gestalt. This lady, she's wearing a shirt. And even though she's wearing a shirt, her concern is, does this shirt match my skirt? That's what her mind's on. So she's looking at the bigger picture of how she looks as a whole, as opposed to, hmm, I wonder what font this is. You know, she's looking at the bigger picture here. And we're going to analyze this a bit more. So here is the gestalt in action. The whole is other than the sum of parts, a theory on how we've seen the world. Here's a, a great picture. Uh, I think this is a, from a TV show, Breaking Bad. I don't watch TV, so I've never seen it, but people have told me it's a great show. Here, they only show half his face, because that's all you need. Half his face to tell the story, and then they're able to, to tell the message. I am not in danger. I am not in danger. A guy opens the door and gets shot, and you think that of me. No, I'm the one who knocks, okay? Sends a powerful message. <laughs> And then here's another version. Here, just a couple of design elements, but you put this together, you know it's a pig. It's the nose, maybe the, the, the heart-shaped eyebrows, maybe the cheeks. I don't know. You just know that this is a pig. Your brain fills in the gaps. Here is, uh, I think this is, it's either a red Death Star or a moon, and you see a silhouette of a mountain here. Again, this, it's like someone just took a chunk out of this, this circle here, but your brain puts it together knowing it's a mountain. Here's another thing. Um, this, is, this is kind of funny. This artist here, this is actually an illustration of a professional wrestler, Andre the Giant. And he had a picture of him and he decided to zoom in on his face. And that's actually the obey. And you may have seen it before. So here he zoomed in on this illustration of the guy's face, obey. And then he's taking this and cutting it in half because it's so identifiable, you know, it's in part of our culture that you instantly know what this is. So with Gestalt, there's an art movement known as minimalism. Minimalism is the simplest way to express an idea. I wanted to focus on a few styles of art and just some things to think about when you're creating your shirts. Minimalism is awesome because it's super simple, and, but at the same time, it requires a whole lot of creativity to put this together and an understanding of the gestalt. So here, going back to pop art with Andy Warhol, this is his, his chicken in a can soup. So it's just a few shapes, very basic shapes. In contrast, you know that is a can of chicken soup. Here, Dolly, his most famous artwork is these melting clocks. Here's represented in a minimalistic style. You just get this weird, wavy, warpy circle thing with a few elements of the clock. That's all it needs to express the idea. What is the simplest and least amount of design required to send the message that, or that you can get away with. A famous painting, Scream, you've probably seen the guy, he's like, oh, screaming. Here's done in the minimalistic style. This is Batman. People love silhouettes of Batman. And this is so cool because you take a black sheet of canvas, you just add a, gray, a big blob of gray form here, another gray form here, and then the bat symbol. And then you got two little elements here. You look at this and your brain puts this together. You know that's the Batman. Another cool thing I want to say is the use of color. It's black and white and then they use yellow to bring emphasis to the bat symbol. Now, they could have made the eyes yellow, maybe the mouth yellow, but that would have competed with this. By this standing out on its own, it's emphasis. You know that's the thing to look at and then your eye draws out further to complete the picture. So just ways to look at things. Uh, here's another style. I thought this was cute. Coffee Bandit, a t-shirt. Just a simple image of a coffee cup using rectangles. You got a little bit of eyes to show expression and then a handkerchief as the bandit. And again, they're using red as the foreground to stand out. Here's a silhouette of Marilyn Monroe. Pretty cool. Yellow hair, red lipstick. Boom, Marilyn Monroe. Here's another form, and I think I mentioned this earlier, polygon style graphics. So polygon style is taking like a bunch of triangles and grouping them together to create an image. And so that tends to, these geometric shape tends to be in right now. Here's, I love this. This is a, another picture of Obama. I think this part right here, by adding this little element here, you know that's Obama. Here, going back to uh, <laughs> Pony. Uh, here's a minimalist style of Pony. And so your eyes 
your 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 brain is going to comp complete the picture. <laughs> Catherine's phony. Yes. And then here's a picture I love. Anyone could have done this. This isn't nothing special. It tells the story of a shark about to eat this guy going surfing. And here's the sun. I love this because it's from the perspective of looking underwater and you see the silhouette of a shark. You could have got, you know, clip art of this on Pixabay and a surfer dude. And just by adding these two elements together and then the sun, again, that emphasis, the yellow, it tells a story and in a very simple way to tell the story. So that's minimalism. Here's some other minimalism in action. You can see the evolution of the Starbucks logo, something to consider. This is, was the original logo right here. They thought it was pretty hip and cool. It was brown, which represents coffee, right? So it makes sense. Looks good on a cup and uh, Starbucks. And then they decided to, this little, this little lady here is going to be her, the, the icon, the mascot. Then it evolved to green. So a designer decided to use green for Starbucks. And then they took this lady here and they created a simplified version of her. Well, this is so iconic. They're like, wait a minute. Do we need to have the word Starbucks on here? Let's just zoom in on the lady. And there you go. The modern Starbucks logo and minimalism in action. Your brain's going to complete the picture. The second you see this, you know it's Starbucks. So it's a really elegant and evolved way of telling a story. And really cool stuff. Here's another cool thing of minimalism to kind of completely different perspective. Here, Keith, Mick, Bill, Charlie, and Brian. Does anyone know who these guys are? Wendy, RS, Rolling Stones. You guys know it. Just the first name alone. Why bother with the last name? You don't need it. Get rid of it. Same concept again. John, Paul, Ringel, George. That's it. You know who they are. And then, uh, you know, my personal favorite, Joey, Dee Dee, Johnny, and Tommy. Yeah, I know who those guys are. They're the, the Ramones. And so really, really cool. Another form of minimalism. Here's a, another style. I, I consider this to be minimalism. Some people might say, no, that's different. But I think it's in the same spirit as pixel art. So that's really popular. And it goes back to what I said about the digital world being reflected on the physical world. So pixel art was something, you know, early video games were very pixelated because computers couldn't handle that many pixels at the same time. And people got so familiar with it that they loved that style and it's actually considered an art style now and a great way to communicate, a fun way to communicate, I should say. So here we have, here we have a dinosaur. We have a ghost with a tombstone. We have a knight and pixel art. Here we have cake. This is just a picture of cake, but because it looks like an old school video game, it's kind of cool. Here, very simple pixel art telling the story of uh, meteors killing the dinosaurs. Um, here's a horse done in pixel art and uh, you know notice that they're using patterns using pattern maybe a bit of rhythm to communicate that this is a horse and to add a sense of, of texture for the hair really cool stuff here's pizza very simple you got maybe four colors here with maybe five colors to communicate pizza i love nerds great example of typography mixed with a, an icon a shape to communicate in pixel art a bike here, this is a hamburger. And then this one I thought was really cool. It looks like Tetris to me, a bunch of pieces falling down. It's not super clear, but I, I don't know. I kind of liked it. So I just wanted to show you. It's old school, but actually it's kind of new. I mean, this is done on a t-shirt and this is something that you can create in Photoshop. Another thing you can do is, it's really, really cool, is that independent, there's a whole community of independent game development. And a lot of guys, they're great programmers, but they're horrible artists. So there's a lot of artists that have created pixel art that are public domain. You can go and look up public domain pixel art and you can get elements of these designs and they're free. You know, the person put them together and just gave it to the community. And so you can take these pixel art, kind of curate a collection of them, put it together to tell a story, use that for your designs. So there's something to think about. And then, so minimalism has been around for a while and now what's happening, some people are calling it minimalism 2.0. Okay, we are using the simplest elements to communicate an idea to you. Now let's get a little bit more creative. And so here again, polygon design, instantly identifiable. You know who this guy is. You know, it's just a collection of triangles, shadows, colors, but you know who this is. Flat design is becoming really popular. Google 
they wanted to compete with Apple, so they hired a group of artists to come together with a style of art called uh, material design. It's actually principles called material design. You can look it up. They have these set of rules, and it's basically flat design. Oh, the guy? <laughs> can you guys tell me who this guy? Fonzie, James Dean. <laughs> oh, Marty, Marty McFly. You got the red. <laughs> uh, you know, Catherine didn't know who it was either. I just assumed maybe it was, it was wrong on my part. It, Michael J. Fox, absolutely. Marty McFly from Back to the Future. His iconic red jacket, the kind of vest. <laughs> Europeans. <laughs> maybe that's it. Yeah, that's Marty McFly uh, from Back to the Future. If you know it, you know it. You know, and that's a great thing. Uh, about something. You know, it's a popular movie. Not everyone's going to know it, but those that know it, know it. Instantly identifiable. Doesn't take much to send that message across. <laughs> it's been a while. <laughs> That's funny. So uh, going back to this flat design, basically it's like a form of minimalism. Uh, the big thing with flat design is you see these shadows kind of like go off in a direction and that kind of makes it interesting. So that's flat design. Oh, here's another polygon. You see a frog done in polygon that was clipped from a shirt here's flat design with typography keep it simple if you have a simple idea you want to express here's some a way you can express it using flat design i'm hungry put it in flat design just something to do and then here's some variations of minimalism so here you have a skeleton they put a bicycle on his eyes they put a bicycle to create eyes kind of a fun way fun play on design and then here is typography they really messed with the layout but I think most people can see that this is L-O-V-E for love. It's just a cool way to put it all together. <laughs> so, and, and um, that is it. So, wow. We actually went through this a lot quicker than I thought. Thank you very much for watching the class. And I hope you enjoyed it. And I hope you got a lot out of it. This class is part of our T-Shirt Revolutionaries course. And if you'd like to learn more, you can check out the link below. You might also be interested in our new product, uh, Tangent Templates. It's a collection of ready-made templates to help jumpstart your online business with Amazon CreateSpace. I am super excited about it. As someone who creates books on CreateSpace, this is something that I've been wanting for myself for a very long time. I'm glad I finally buckled down and put it together. And so if you'd like to learn more about it, you can check out the link below. Thank you.